So we begin in 2 Samuel 7, where David wants to build a house for God, and God says through Nathan, the prophet, and Nathan will figure prominently here in a little bit later in the chapter, but right now, through Nathan, God tells David, no, I will build you a house. And he means, on the one hand, the house of David, the dynasty. And in fact, there's David, there's Solomon, and there is a king from the Davidic line on the throne in Judah, at least until the uh, exile, the Babylonian captivity. And, of course, we Christians believe Jesus Christ, son of David, is the fulfillment of that prophecy. And in fact, the house that God promises David is the church. It is the ongoing dynasty of Christ on earth, though, of course, it's filled with sinners and it's not necessarily run as though it's the kingdom of God, but it is the permanent house of David the permanent dwelling place of those who are righteous and who seek to be after God's own heart. Then we have Psalm 24, which we were told is one of the Psalms that celebrates the entrance of the Ark of God. The one um, article I read said that this would have been sung when the Ark was brought into the temple, which Solomon builds. Solomon builds the physical house of God, the first temple in Jerusalem, and when the Ark of the Covenant is brought in, which contains the presence of God, the, the Psalm 24 would have been sung. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. And of course, for me, the most memorable version of Psalm 24 is Handel's version from Messiah, I had shared with Gabby not long ago another song from Messiah based on Scripture. All the songs in Messiah are based on Scripture. And uh, Lift Up Your Heads is one of the most stunning. Uh, and so I will embed it under this video so that you can watch that. You can follow along with the lyrics which come from the psalm, and you can also see the musical score and experience some of the glory of that music. With the reading from St. Paul, we hear about God making the two one and reconciling what in the verse is the animosity between Jews and Gentiles, but which really, by implication, is the duplicity and the split in our own nature. The old Adam and the new creation that exists in us that we war with, but that Christ reconciles. It's interesting to me that the Comedy of Errors, an early play by Shakespeare, is set in Ephesus, and that the Epistle to the Ephesians, in many ways the central theological point is this reconciliation, making the two one. And the Comedy of Errors is about a pair of twins, identical twins, who don't know that the other exists and somehow a reconciliation of the two takes place in the Comedy of Errors. I don't know if anybody's mentioned that because I haven't read many critical essays on the Comedy of Errors, but that's always occurred to me. Um, and that has to do with, of course, from St. James, we hear about being single-hearted, uh, that if we are of two hearts, we will not get what we pray for. And of course, my students understand, struggling as you do, with our own inner duality that we long for this. We long for integrity, functioning as one, functioning as the new man and not the old Adam. Let's look though, let's screen share. Um, and I wanna get to the right spot before I bring up the thing, since sometimes it doesn't work for me. Let's take a look at the commentary on Mark 14, 51 and 52. This is the only gospel where this incident is recorded. Uh, in the garden, after his betrayal, the disciples flee from Jesus and the arresting soldiers in fear. 
And a certain young man followed him, having a linen cloth cast about him over his naked body, and they lay, lay hold on him. And it continues, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. Now I want to go back, but I don't know if it's going to show me what I wanted to see, so I'll have to scroll down. This remarkable incident we hear from Ellicott's commentary for English readers that follows is narrated by St. Mark only. Now, they go off into some a strange, this is one of the times when I don't appreciate this commentary at all, because they go off into a, um, a guessing game as to who this young man is, and they're claiming it's probably not Mark. Uh, a better commentary is here, the pulpit commentary. And they talk about the fact that the Greek word of what this disciple had around him is sindon. The sindon was a fine linen cloth indicating that he, this anonymous disciple, belonged to a family in good circumstances. It is an unusual word. In every other place of the New Testament where it is used, it refers to the garment or shroud used to cover the bodies of the dead. This is why Ellicott thinks it's actually Lazarus. The tradition has been that this is St. Mark himself, and he's referring to himself in the third person as St. John does throughout his gospel. It has always occurred to me that this happens right before the torture, the darkness, the horror. This is almost the nakedness of our human condition. This is kind of an early ecce homo, behold the man. Because here we see this young man fleeing naked from a garden, in a way, as Adam did. But Adam, of course, had clothing that God helped, that God himself helped to fashion. The nakedness of the human condition, the vulnerability. But if it's a burial cloth, or if it's the same kind of material as used in a burial cloth, it's almost a ripping away of the veil that covers the most frightening aspect of the human condition, our mortality. And we see not only the naked man, but, you know, if you think about it, people are buried in their nice suits, but not really. I mean, I, at least I think that's the, what happens. That's what happens when you go to funeral parlors, people aren't laid out naked. And yet that's how we're born. And that's really how we die. And here, right before the horrors of the passion, we have a young man running away in fear. The captors grabbing onto him, and he runs out of his garment and runs away naked. Exposed, vulnerable, missing perhaps his burial cloth, facing the horrors of our ultimate destiny, our doom, which of course becomes a different kind of doom with the uh, salvation that is purchased by the cross. At any rate, I think that moment is very symbolically powerful. And I think it probably would pay to meditate upon that. It's almost like, you know, the stations of the cross. This is almost a pre-first station. You know, Jesus is stripped of his garments. That's one of the, that's perhaps the 12th station or something around there. Jesus is stripped of his garments. I've always thought of that as all of us go through that if we die of old age, because little by little, you're stripped of your faculties. Jesus goes through what every man does in a way. And then St. Mark or Lazarus or whoever this is goes through this right before everything begins. Well, anyway, listen to uh, Lift Up Your Heads. For those of you who are watching on YouTube, I'm going to have a new website and there will be more stuff on it, hopefully by the end of the month, so you won't see Lift Up Your Heads. But uh, uh, I'll put the link in the little description because it's a worthwhile rendition.